Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, can, can you hear me in the back? It, is this uh, the microphone working okay? Is it, is it okay? Okay, good. Uh, so um, today I'm going to present on really on two, a reflection on, on two works, two, two approaches to um, death and dying. Um, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad to be here, and I'm, I'm glad that there's some uh, uh, people here who are enduring a, a, whole, a whole, I think you've had a set of talks on, on death and dying, and that's a, that's a tough subject. So um, recently I've been working on a, on a book project on, on this um, topic, and, and today I'm going to share um, two works that, that I encountered. Um, one is um, Sherwin Nolan's How We Die, Reflections on Life, Final Chapter, and Sherwin Nolan um, in the 1990s was a leading expert on, became a leading expert on thinking, on helping people understand uh, how death happens, um, disease, uh, and so forth. Uh, Sherwin Nolan, though, I need to uh, mention this, was an advocate, uh, a quiet advocate, but an advocate of euthanasia. So Sherwin Nolan is, is not the path forward. But what I'm going to show is that there is a Christian path forward and um, the Christian path forward is going to um, identify certain weaknesses in Sherwin Nolan's um, way of understanding how we die. And um, the Christian path forward is just going to be much better. So it's, it's really a simple paper. I have to admit that. In his best-selling How We Die, Reflections on Life's Final Chapter, published in 1994, Sherwin Nolan observes he wrote his book for the purpose of, quote, conversing with people who want to know what it is like to die. That is, what are the major diseases that cause our deaths and how we respond to those diseases during the dying process. 16 centuries before Nolan wrote his book, another best-selling book on dying appeared. Gregory of Nyssa's The Life of St. Macrina, published around 383 AD, a book that is about the death of his beloved sister Macrina. If Nolan's main purpose is to describe in concrete detail how we actually die. The reason Gregory wants to tell Macrina's story is that she exemplifies what Christian dying and Christian living is all about. So in what follows, I compare the perspectives of Nolan and Gregory of Nyssa, or really Macrina. Nolan helps us to see that we need not and should not look forward to a serene dying process. Nolan rightly emphasizes that our hope must involve both looking backward upon our lives with gratitude and looking forward toward a wider framework in which our lives have meaning. For his part, Gregory helps us to understand how and to what we should look backward and look forward in the process of our dying. Okay, have I, have I got the microphone right? Is it, do I need to pitch it back or backward or forward? Okay. Okay, so Sherwin Nolan. One of Sherwin Nolan's central concerns is that contemporary medicine often leads people who are dying to undergo painful and useless treatments that, in fact, do not allow them the time and space needed to say goodbye properly to their loved ones. Nolan suggests that accepting our dying will generally come through the feeling that our life has been, quote, useful and rewarding. In the broadest sense, Nolan thinks of, quote, useful, a useful and rewarding life um, in an ecological and cosmic framework within which our death serves the larger cosmic unfolding whereby new organisms can live. He states in this vein, quote, if by our work and our, our pleasure, our triumphs and our failures, each of us is contributing to an evolving process of continuity, not only of our species, but of the entire balance of nature. The dignity we create in time, uh, the time allotted to us becomes a continuum with the dignity we achieve by the altruism of accepting the necessity of death." End quote. During our lives, then, we can learn to live by, quote, a realistic expectation end quote, of the kind of creatures that we are. Quote, we die so that others may live. 
Although Newlin emphasizes that the process of dying needs to be as focused as much as possible on relationships rather than on seeking medical miracles, even at the very last stages of life, he also counsels us not to expect a dignified and serene deathbed experience in which we say goodbye to our loved ones. He makes clear that the process of dying is generally painful and undignified. In this sense, most people are, quote, fated to die badly, end quote, because of the ravages of the mortal disease. In his view, therefore, a dignified death is not measured by the process of dying or the kind of disease, let alone by the deathbed experience, but by, quote, the honesty and grace of the years of life that are ending, end quote. Along these lines, he remarks, quote, the greatest dignity is to be, to be found in death is the dignity of the life that preceded it. This is the form of hope we can all achieve and is the most, most abiding of all. Hope resides in the meaning of what our lives have been. Um, so we're looking backward here. As he states, quote, who has lived in dignity dies in dignity, end quote. Now for Newland, dying in dignity is not only backward looking toward the useful and rewarding elements of one's life, but it's also forward looking um, toward the contribution that one's death claimed altruistically makes to the natural cycle, quote, by which each generation is to be succeeded by the next, end quote. When it comes to dying in dignity, Newlin considers it important to say that the dying person achieves dignity by giving himself or herself altruistically to the organic necessity of death within the cosmic unfolding. Newlin presents us as giving up our lives for the sake of future organisms. This altruistic gesture achieves dignity in dying in part because the other alternative which uh, many people take, namely resisting death to the very end, is as futile as it is non-altruistic. So Nolan sees that as um, lacking in dignity. Nolan is aware of the unique dignity of each human person. And so he construes death as an enemy. Each person has, quote, potential unfulfilled and in some sense, quote, unfinished business, end quote. Each person has relationships and promises to others that when the person is dead, leave a permanent gap in others' lives. On the first page of his book's introduction, Newland describes death as, quote, a permanent unconsciousness in which there is neither void nor vacuum, in which there is simply nothing, end quote. Now, I'm not sure how he, how he realized, how he knows this. As Nolan admits, this nothingness, quote, seems so different from the nothing that preceded life. Here you see Nolan is different from someone like Richard Dawkins, who claims that before we were born we were nothing, after we die we'll be nothing, it's the same thing. Nolan um, admits the nothingness is different from the nothingness that preceded, preceded life. Although he does not explain this difference, surely it consists in the fact that once we come into existence, nothingness becomes the negation of our utterly unique consciousness. In Nolan's view, the, the process of dying is nothing less than, quote, the disintegration of the dying person's humanity, end quote. If so, then how can Nolan argue that a dying person can achieve dignity by embracing this cosmic process and thus embracing his or her own annihilation? Is it dignified for a human person to bow down reverently to the brutal stamping out of one's own consciousness? I am probing into why Nolan thinks it necessary to affirm that the dying not only find dignity in looking backward, the back, backward looking glance to a useful and rewarding life, but also why he thinks it necessary to affirm um, the forward-looking dignity, quote, we achieve by the altruism of accepting the necessity of death, end quote. Why does he appeal to the cosmic process of generation and corruption as an aspect of the dignity of dying? My, my supposition is that 
he wants something meaningful to which when dying and in preparing now for his future death, um, uh, Dr. Nolan has passed away. I, um, I, forget, I forget exactly when. Um, he, he wants something meaningful to which when dying he can hand himself over. But, but if the cosmic process to which he wishes to hand himself over means nothing other than the permanent annihilation of his consciousness, this cosmic process hardly seems truly worthy of human dignity. Even so, it is no wonder that Nolan holds that dignity is achieved in dying by freely giving ourselves to something bigger and thereby locating some kind of future. Now, Nolan states that when it comes his time to die, his hope will be found in the way that he lives his life. Quote, so that those who value what I am will have profited by my time on earth and be left with comforting reflections, comforting recollections of what we have meant to one another. End quote. This hope is backward looking. It is, quote, recollections of relationships and of a useful and rewarding life. In this description of things that he thinks will console him in his own dying, Nolan doesn't here mention the dignity that he later describes in terms of, quote, contributing to an evolving process of continuity, not only of our species, but of the entire balance of nature, end quote. And indeed, if we die into utter annihilation, leaving our loved ones only with, quote, recollections of what we have meant to one another, I do not see how such annihilation, no matter how altruistically embraced, could be particularly comforting or hopeful on one's deathbed. So in planning his own dying, Nolan thinks he will be consoled by looking backward upon his life to his, quote, recollections, positive relationships, and useful rewarding in life that benefited others. Looking backward, however, is not sufficient. That, that's my key point right now. Um, looking backward is not sufficient. There must be a forward-looking element in, in human dying so that the thought of death is not unbearable. Nolan tacitly admits this, as I noted above, by calling for the dying person to achieve dignity by altruistically giving himself or herself over to the, evolu to the cosmic process, um, the cosmic unfolding. So now, my second part. Um, this is the part um, that I, I think is more, is more true. You know, and um, this is the part about Christian dying. In dying, therefore, we need to look backward upon our lives, and we also need to look forward in some positive way. That's what I got from Newland. How should a Christian do these things? I suggest looking to Macrina, a Christian who died in the late 4th, fourth century, for guidance. <clears throat> Macrina was the sister of Gregory of Nyssa, and we know about her because Gregory wrote a description of her death. But, but for my purposes here, She's just an exemplar of, of how a Christian should look backward and look forward in dying. According to Gregory, even as a young child, his sister followed the command to pray constantly. 1 Thessalonians 4.17. He remarks that, quote, there was none of the Psalms which she did not know, since she recited each part of the Psalter at the proper times of the day when she rose from her bed, performed or rested from her duties, sat down to eat or rose up from the table, end quote. Gregor presents Macrina as an exemplar of Jesus' command that his followers, quote, be not anxious, saying, quote, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear or what will happen to the stock market is out of zero, which it seems like today it might be. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, for, for the Gentiles seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well, Matthew 6. By her life of generous service and renunciation of her privileges, which Gregory describes in these things, Gregory describes in some detail, I'm skipping over here. Macrina shows that she has chosen all her life, really, to serve God. When Gregory arrives for a long delayed visit to his sister, he finds her, quote, caught in the grip of a grievous sickness. 
He then enables us to witness her dying. As her body is deteriorating quite rapidly, she recalls with gratitude, this looking backward, the events of her life, and she looks forward to eternal life. Gregory describes her attitude in, in Pauline terms. Quote, she was already looking toward the prize of her upward calling and all but applying the words of the apostle to herself when he says that, quote, all there is to come now is the crown of righteousness reserved for me, which the righteous judge will give to me since I have fought the good fight, I have run the race to the end, and I've kept the faith, end quote. In the presence of Gregory, Macrina looks backward toward her life that is now nearly over. Gregory states that, quote, she took up the story of the events of her life from infancy and retold them all in order as in a historical narrative. The point of her looking back is not simply just to tell life, to review her life as it were, but quote, to give thanks to God. Gratitude is the measure of her looking backward on her life. So that's, that's obviously a key point right there, gratitude. Macrina's maternal grandfather had been executed and his possessions distributed to others. And Macrina's paternal grandparents, quote, had their possessions confiscated for, the profession, for their profession of Christ. In accord with Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 9, God repaid this bountiful sowing on the part of Macrina's grandparents with the bountiful reaping made by Macrina's parents. As you probably know, Christianity became legal in this time period in the Roman Empire. This reaping was both spiritual and material. And when it came time to divide the inheritance left by her parents, which was quite substantial, Macrina gave her full portion to the church to distribute in service to the poor in accord with Acts 4, 34 to 35. Macrina's looking backward at her life doesn't recall material ease or comfort, even though she could have had these things. Rather, as Gregory summarizes her deathbed reflections, quote, she never stopped working with her hands in the service of God, nor did she ever look to man for help, nor through any human agency did there come to her opportunity for a life of comfort, end quote. Her life was one of prayer and work for others. Every life, of course, can be looked at from various angles. From one angle, life can seem mere drudgery and troubles, while from another angle, the blessings, however great or small they may have been, stand out. Macrina urges that life be recalled from the perspective of gratitude for the blessings received. So that's kind of like the first, the first lesson Macrina helps us see um, that is somewhat present in, in Newland, but, but really not present as it could be. When Macrina is finished looking over her life uh, with gratitude, looking backward, what happens next is crucially important. In dying as in living, her life is, is fundamentally forward-looking and not merely as in Newland, forward-looking toward what others will think of us after we die or toward some sort of cosmic unfolding of a process, an organic process, to which our annihilation makes a small but necessary contribution. After Macrina had finished the backward-looking story of her life and blessings, she hears the community choir singing its, quote, evening Thanksgiving prayers, end quote. The choir thing singing Thanksgiving prayers shows that in dying she's acting as she did in living. Gregory states that, quote, the great Macrina sent me off to church to and withdrew herself to God in prayer. And quote, her action of sending Gregory to church to pray for her and for himself with a spirit of thanksgiving while she remains alone to pray is reminiscent of Jesus' withdrawal to pray by himself in his dying. The next morning, Gregory comes to her room and sees she will not live through another day. Her breathing is already shallow and tortured. She makes clear that she does not fear death since her life has already been given to God in her daily prayer and service. In dying, she's simply embracing, quote, what she had chosen for this life right from the beginning up to her last breath, end quote. Gregory, however, portrays her here in strongly platonic terms. And of course, this was, this was a, um, something that early Christians did. 
um, despite his use of a biblical understanding of angels, he says, quote, it was as if an angel had providentially assumed human form, an angel in whom there was no affinity for, nor attachment to the life of the flesh, end quote. Although Gregory goes on to mention her, quote, pure divine love of the unseen bridegroom, end quote, Jesus, our Lord, Gregory emphasizes how desirous she is to be free of the body. Quote, she seemed to transmit the desire which was in her heart to rush to the one she longed for, so that freed from the fetters of the body, she might swiftly be with him. End quote. So now we have a question, right? The question is, is the body a mere platonic weight pulling down and, and chaining the soul? Well, in, in my view, um, this passage reflects Paul's statement. So we're still with Paul here to the Philippians that, quote, to live is Christ and to die is gain, and my desire is to de depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Philippians 1, 21 to 23. Now, this emphasis on Macrina's growing configuration with Christ through her suffering and dying, and on her forward-looking expectation of union with Christ in accordance with her backward-looking remembrance of her life in Christ, is augmented by two further details reported by Gregory. First, and th this is, this is an interesting thing that I'd never thought of at all before, her friends turn her bed toward the east so as to face the risen Lord who coming in from the east at last judgment. They were, they were eschatological Christians. You know, they were anticipating N.T. Wright um, 1,700 years ago. The point here consists in her forward-looking expectation of encounter with her Lord, the one who will judge and put to right all things. Second, she no longer reflects upon her past life. Now at this stage we're dying, she no longer reflects upon her past life and no longer has time for further instruction of her brother or her friends. Instead, on the verge of dying, she now becomes as forward-looking as she can be. Gregory relates that, quote, she stopped conversing with us and was with God in prayer for the rest of the time, reaching out her hands in supplication and speaking in a low, faint voice so we could only just hear what was said, end quote. As she prays to God then in her physical agony, Gregory is able to overhear her prayer. Her prayer in the stylized form that Gregory presents it is as a thoroughly Christ-centered prayer. She begins by praising her Lord for, quote, having released us from the fear of death. Here she alludes to Hebrews 2.15, yeah, which states that Christ, quote, delivered all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage, end quote. She goes on to express the Christian understanding of death as a passage. Quote, you have made the end of life here on earth a beginning of true life for us. It's a very forward-looking. Macrina looks forward not just to, not to, not to a disembodied existence in heaven. Now here's the response again to Plato. Macrina looks forward not to a disembodied existence in heaven, but to the last judgment and the resurrection of the just. She says in praise of Christ, quote, you let our bodies rest and sleep in due season and you awaken them again at the sound of the trumpet, the last trumpet. You entrust to the earth our bodies of earth which you fashion with your own hands and you restore again what you have given, transforming with incorruptibility and grace what is mortal and deformed in us, end quote. In fact, Macrina's forward-looking prayer in dying involves the whole cosmos, no less then does Newland's suggestion that in dying we should altruistically hand our lives over to a cosmic annihilating process. Macrina envisions the whole of material reality being transformed, quote, with incor incorruptibility and grace. Um, I, I was discussing this with Scott McKnight. This is an interesting, like what's gonna happen to the whole of material reality? Um, but she imagines it being transformed still be material, still be the cosmos, but, but incorruptible, filled with grace, translucent to God. Her perspective accords, I think, with 1 Corinthians 15, 42, 
So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. And she looks forward to the culmination of the entirety of human and cosmic history, when, as, as Paul says, quote, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye so at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. 1 Corinthians 15. So referencing Galatians 3.13, and 2 Corinthians 5.21, Macrina continues by praising God for having, quote, redeemed us from the curse and from sin, having become both on our behalf. By this stage of the, her prayer, its deep roots in salvation history are clear. We've already seen that Macrina looks forward not to an otherworldly heaven but to a perfected and transformed material cosmos marked by bodily resurrection. Now we see that the hinge from Macrina's understanding of the defeat of death is not the release of the soul from the body. That's not how death is defeated, like when your soul escapes from your body. But rather, the hinge is the historical work of Jesus Christ. In dying, therefore, Macrina is moving into the fulfillment of history rather than escaping into an ahistorical state or into a negation of history. The penalty of sin is death, and Israel's punishment for violating the covenant was the covenantal curse of exile. Now, McCrean didn't put it that way. That's, that's more empty right there. In his dying, Jesus Christ took on these penalties for us. And as McCrean says in her prayer, quote, he crushed the heads of the serpent who had seized man in his jaws because of the abyss of our disobedience, end quote. In looking forward to everlasting life with God, Macrina has in view the whole of history, since her reference is intended to be here to the very beginning of human history in which God tells the serpent, quote, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15. This passage was consistently understood by early Christians to be a prefiguring of the devil unjustly imposing death upon our Lord Jesus Christ, a death by which Christ crushed the devil. Macrina next praises Jesus for opening up the path of resurrection through his own death. In Jesus' death, she finds the meaning and value of her dying. Again, she is following Paul. Quote, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. If we have died with Christ, we, shall believe, we believe we shall also live with him. Romans 6, 5, 8. By paraphrasing Hebrews 2, 14, which teaches that Christ, through his death, destroyed him who has the power of death, that is the devil, Macrina rejoices in the salvific meaning that Christ has infused into death. What would otherwise have been a path to deepest exile and alienation, or as Nolan suggests, even, even possibly to annihilation, has become a path to the perfect fulfillment of relationship and communion. Furthermore, in her dying, as in her life, Macrina does not rely upon words or interior thoughts alone for her forward-looking communion with God. She speaks of, quote, a, a visible token the sign of the Holy Cross, end quote, that enables those who are marked by this sign to accomplish, quote, the destruction of the adver adversary, end quote. The reference here may be to Revelation 7, 3, where the angel of God calls to the destroying angels, end quote, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God upon their foreheads. And of course, see also Ezekiel 9, 4 here. Macrina's insistence upon this physical sign of the cross shows that Gregory's earlier comparison of Macrina in her dying to, quote, an angel who had moved beyond the things of this world should not be interpreted as though Macrina were advocating some sort of platonic escape from history or from, or from the physical things of the world. In her dying prayer, too, Macrina's forward-looking intensity incorporates some backward element backward-looking elements regarding her life. And looking forward to life with Christ, she recalls her lifelong devotion to Christ. Importantly, however, this is where we did gratitude 
We already did gratitude and looking backward, now we're gonna do something else here. Importantly, she recalls her lifelong devotion to Christ, not as a saint, but as a sinner. She compares herself to the thief crucified by the side of Christ. And she begs mercy for her sins. Christ was crucified by two thieves, and while one reviled him, the other defended him and asked, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which Jesus replied, truly I say to you, today you will be, we be, today you will be with me in paradise, Luke 23. So in looking forward, Macrina presents herself to God as one who depends entirely upon Christ. She does not rely on a nameless God or an otherworldly afterlife, but rather she relies on Jesus. In describing her love for God, she recalls that during her life she has loved God with all her strength. Here is see Mark 1230, and indeed has consecrated to God her whole bodily life. Now here she has in mind um, uh, that she remains single. So on, here see um, uh, 1 Corinthians 7. But she recalls this in a spirit of humility. That's the key. Relying for salvation solely on the power of the cross of Christ. She prays, quote, You who have cut through the flame of the fiery sword and brought to paradise the man who is crucified with you, remember me also in your kingdom. So very forward-looking, depending on mercy, gratitude when she looks backward, but also recognizing she's a sinner when she looks backward. So repentance, then looking forward, looking forward with great joy, but also um, with desire for mercy. At the same time, in her dying, she makes clear that she is not relying on Christ as though she had not previously known him. Like Paul, who states that, quote, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Galatians 2.20. Macrina states that in her life, she, too, has been, quote, crucified with you, Christ, for I have nailed my flesh out of reverence for you, and I have feared your judgments, end quote. Like Paul, she has sought to, quote, pommel her body and subdue it, and the reference to 1 Corinthians 9, so as to share in the blessings of the gospel. Although Macrina lays claim to having been crucified with Christ, just like Paul, she does not presume on this relationship. In looking forward to everlasting union with her Lord, she recognizes the threat posed by death and begs Christ for strength to persevere. Dying will seal her ultimate destiny, and so dying is inevitably a fearful thing. Macrina's main concern is to beg mercy for sin. Gosh, you can see how close um, Gregor of Nyssa and Augustine are, if you're familiar with Augustine's reflections on death. Dying will seal her ultimate destiny, and so dying is a fearful thing. Macrina's main concern is to beg mercy then. She prays that God will keep her safe from hell, meaning the everlasting loss of communion with God, everlasting punishment. Not the immortality of the soul, which of course she, she does affirm, but rather charity is what determines our eternal life, according to Macrina. And the strength of our charity does not suffice. Our own strength, our own charity does not suffice to make this crossing by our own power. Mercy, the forgiveness of sins, is at the very center of Macrina's consciousness as she looks forward to the fearful journey of death. With the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, in, in, in view, she prays, quote, let not the dreadful abyss separate me from your chosen ones. Let not the slander stand against me on my journey, end quote. Dying is a journey that has a precise goal, to reach Christ's chosen ones, the blessed, who even now are filled with love, the blessed dead. For the dramatic journey, then, that is the dying process, because it's a dramatic journey here, backward looking, forward looking, repentance is imperative. The dying person is a sinner about to face the all-holy Lord. Embracing Christ's cross is impossible without true repentance. Therefore, Macrina prays urgently for forgiveness with an intensity that belies the angelic serenity depicted by Gregory, but that in fact flows 
For what Gregory calls her longing to, quote, rush impulsively to the beloved, to her beloved, end quote, since she cannot fully know her own heart, even though she knows that her life has been devoted to Christ, she prays, quote, let not my sin be discovered before your eyes if I have been overcome in any way because of nature's weakness and of sin in word or deed or thought. You who have earth, on earth the power to forgive sins, forgive me, end quote. So the final words of Macrina's prayer emphasize once more that her body is dying and very soon she will be a soul before the judgment of Christ. Only the forgiveness won by Christ will enable her truly to draw breath again. End quote. The journey of dying is one on which her whole life, all her living now hinges. She asks God that she, quote, may be found before you in the stripping off of my body without stain or blemish in the beauty of my soul. But may my soul be received blameless and immaculate into your hands as an incense offering before your face. Now she knows that can only happen in Christ. She knows that without any of the earthly things she's depended on for earthly life and status, she's about to be in the presence of the God who knows her utterly. Thus, her appeal, appeal to the sacrificial imagery of, um, of, an, in, of a sacrificial offering to describe her dying is deeply moving because she implores God by his power to turn her dying into a pleasing offering in union with Christ's fulfillment of all the, the old covenant sacrifices. So to express her bodily union with the cross as well as by God's merciful grace her interior union with the cross, Macrina physically traces the sign of the cross on her eyes, her mouth, and her heart while she is praying, thereby asking God to forgive whatever sin she may have committed and to conform her completely to Christ and to do so by Christ's power. Her completion of this act, this last act of tracing the sign of the cross, brings her prayer to an end and she breathes her last. Her eyes and her mouth are closed. Her hands are suitably arranged, so her bodily dying does not require the usual closing of the eyes and so forth. Now, now, now Gregory may have stylized this. It could well be. Showing her respect, showing his respect for the unity of soul and body. Gregory tells us that, quote, the whole position of her body was so spontaneously and beautifully harmonized that any hand to compose the features was superf superfluous. End quote. And it, and it comes to an end there. So I'm going to reach my conclusion. Um, and I'll begin with Sherwin Nuland. The, um, poor Sherwin Nuland. He, he, didn't get it, he didn't get it quite right, but he had a tough time because he was going up against um, Macrina. So, and he should have read. I don't think he ever read Macrina. So for Sher, Sherwin Nuland, the stylization that is clearly present in some aspects of Gregory's portrait of his sister's death although of course we don't know, would almost surely undermine its message. Nolan insists that, quote, we cling to an image of our final moments that combines grace with a sense of closure. We need to believe in a clear-minded process, which is the summation of a life, in which the summation of a life takes place. And this happens from Akrina. And Nolan's point is that this likely won't happen for us. In the, at least in his clinical experience of watching um, deaths occur. So while acknowledging the psychological power of this ideal image of our death, Nolan states that, quote, the classic image of dying with dignity must be modified or even discarded. In fact, he kind of discarded it before he even began because I don't think he's ever read the stuff like this. So most dying persons indeed face waves of suffering that take away their abilities and leave them at the mercy of, quote, the indignities being visited on them. And this is so, even if at, quote, the hour of death, even if the hour of death itself is commonly tranquil and often preceded by blissful unawareness, as Nolan recognizes. Nolan states bluntly that, quote, the quest to achieve true dignity fails when our bodies fail. Noting that in his many years of experience, quote, I have not often seen much dignity in the process by which we die. Nolan grants that there are 
a very few exceptions, as Macrina appears to have been. As, as Nolan puts it, not of course with Macrina in mind, quote, occasionally, very occasionally, unique circumstances of death will be granted to someone with a unique personality. And that lucky combination will make it a dignified death happen. But such a confluence of fortune is uncommon, end quote. Despite the ravages of the fever that killed her, Macrina seems to have retained her mental capacities to the end and have been strong enough to sustain prayer even at the very end of her process of dying. That would be, that would be very unusual. Nolan affirmed in his fashion, but arguably somewhat like Gregory, that, quote, the dignity we seek in dying must be found in the dignity which, with which we have lived our lives. Who has lived in dignity dies in dignity. Certainly that's part of Macrina's message also. By dignity, as we saw, Nuland means the following, quote, if by our work and our pleasure, our triumphs and our failures, each of us is contributing to an evolving process of continuity, not only of our species, but of the entire balance of nature, the dignity we create in the time allotted to us becomes a continuum with the dignity we achieve by the altruism of accepting the necessity of death. That's Nuland. So on this basis, Nuland identifies our principal cause for hope in the face of death. Quote, hope resides in the meaning of what our lives have been. Gregory and Macrina dispute and complicate these notions of dignity and hope. And that's part of the, um, the purpose of my paper to show this. Certainly Macrina shows that who has lived in dignity dies in dignity. But dignity involves much more than our achievements or our relationships. Thus, Macrina's dignity consists not least in her begging for forgiveness. As we saw, she cast herself upon the strength of Jesus Christ. For Macrina, living in dignity means relying on the Creator, God who made us and who will transform, quote, with incorruptibility and grace what is mortal and deformed in us, end quote. Because of her reliance upon God, Macrina's looking backward on her past life fits with her looking forward in hope. Recall that for Nuland, in dying, we should look backward upon the useful and rewarding aspects of our life, and we should look forward to our friends' fond memories of us and altruistically to the onward churning of the process, of the cosmic process that is assisted in some small way by our death. But by contrast, Macrina looks backward first and foremost to God's creative and redemptive work. And she looks forward to a deeper union with her Lord. She looks backward with gratitude for her life. Her looking backward, however, recalls not so much her accomplishments, but her union with Christ. That's the center of her gratitude. As she remarks, quote, I too have been crucified with you, Christ, for I have nailed my flesh out of reverence for you and have feared your judgments. End quote. She looks forward to the fullness of sharing in Christ's love by partaking through her suffering in his own, quote, path to the resurrection, end quote. So it's Christ that's the very center of Macrina's mind in living, but in a, and for our purposes here, in dying. It follows that in her looking backward and looking forward, um, that these are focused not on her own dignity, but on the dignity of Christ in whom she finds her true dignity. As Nolan emphasizes should be the case, Macrina's dying fits with her living. Since Macrina has lived a life of self-giving love configured to Christ, her death would have been dignified, even if she had not had time to look backward, to reflect gratefully upon her family, upon her life, to instruct her brother, to say a lengthy and beautiful prayer, to look forward, to make the sign of the cross, to die with her eyes and mouth properly closed in a sign of body soul unity. Because in dying understood precisely as undignified suffering, Macrina confirms that self-giving love and communion are the enduring truth about human dignity. In his self-sacrificial dying out of love for us, Jesus reveals the true dignity of the human person, both in living and in dying. Macrina reflects this dignity as a follower of Jesus. So Macrina's dying is in her living, we find that, quote, from his fullness we've all received grace upon grace, John 1.16. Thank you very much.